What is up? Football fans, UFL fans, but most importantly, Houston Roughnecks fans. Welcome to the Roughnecks Rundown. Before we get into this episode, I want to say, make sure you guys are commenting on the video. Let me know the things you like, the things you don't like, things you want to see. Like I am willing to try almost anything, look into almost anything, except not rooting for the Houston Roughnecks. So uh, I just wanted to make sure I got that out. Let me know. Today, we're going to go over the Houston Roughnecks kickoff event for the season ticket holders and then the meet and greet afterwards. And I'm going to talk about, you know, key players that were brought up, little things, Easter eggs that I got from CJ and Daryl Johnson. Uh, it's going to be a good one. Let's do it. I'm in the big leagues. Told them don't miss me. Balling like Houston. Hey, feeling like Whitney. I need a bag, bro. Send it through clearly. All right. Like I said, episode 24 topics. Uh, I'm going to do a recap of the kickoff event, talk about the stadium, stuff like that, and then key notes taken from Daryl and CJ. They both kind of talked about a lot of things, and I don't know, some of it I think you guys might find interesting, and they didn't record the whole thing. They didn't live stream the entire thing, so I'm going to tell you about it. The first thing I want to do, though, is talk about meeting fellow fans. This was an absolute blast. When it came to covering the Houston Gamblers the past two years of the USFL, one of the big things was a lot of the people that were liking my stuff, that were watching my stuff. It was a lot of family and friends of players. Uh, you know, a lot of moms and dads follow me, a lot of cousins. And so to see, meet people that just love the team, not saying the family isn't fun. I love the family. I love that they enjoy what I do. But to meet other fans that don't have a tie other than the fact that they love this team, right? They just love the Houston Roughnecks. Uh, they love the city of Houston. It was a great time couple names, CT, James. I was on their show. They are great over there. Uh, super nice guys. James even said he's in the 11 jersey, PJ Walker. He said he watched like a bunch of Roughnecks Rundown before to get ready for it. So James, I very much appreciated that, man. Thank you so much. Meeting uh, <laughs> what? Austin and AJ, his son. Dude, two fantastic fans. Absolutely love them. AJ's jersey got signed by Moose. The kid is awesome. I loved meeting them. Texas Pete, the guy down in the bottom left. I met him at the championship last season. Him and his wife, Pat, fantastic people. He gave me this shirt. Uh, he met me in the parking lot before the event and gave me this shirt. And man, Pete, you're the best, dude. Love you. And then Colin and his wonderful girlfriend, EJ, You know he has another show. If you don't watch it, you should. It's another show. He loves the Roughnecks almost more than I do, I got to say. Uh, rough them up podcast, dude. I love meeting all you guys. That was fantastic. So moving on to the actual event, what we were doing, uh, what we were there to do. We were there to meet coach CJ and some things that I noticed about CJ, you know, I've met CJ. I've talked to him before I interviewed him, but seeing somebody in a fully public setting is just different. You know, it really tells you a lot about a person. So the three things I noticed, he was excited, he was humble, and he was a man of the people. That's supposed to be a the space there. But if you see, he stood up, he gave a speech, you know, just kind of a welcome. Thank you for coming. Very nice. His wife was right there, as always, Angel, right there off to the side. And then you see him over here meeting uh, the Predator, the UFL Predator that him and his wife, dude, they have wild masks, like Predator masks. They wear, they have the uh, dreads, all that. And CJ was talking to him like he was just another fan. Like CJ was a fan of the Roughnecks. He was just there chopping it up, smiling, enjoying it. Uh, he even took a photo with me, man. Made uh, <laughs> He made the social guy. I don't want to say his name, put him on blast, but he made him give me the ball. Uh, we took the photo. He was so incredibly nice. He remembered me. Like He's just a man of the people. He's a great guy and somebody who really does care. His entire family was there. Uh, I got the honor of taking a photo of them. His wife, Angel, asked me to take a photo of his entire family. His son went to Rice. Uh, he was so excited to be there. He made the social... Uh, the guy who runs the socials, take him down on the field and take photos. You know, he, he, he told me, I was like, Hey, I want to go down to the field too. Do you know how to get down there? Coach? He was like, this is the only the second time I've been here. He's like, I'm right there with you. And I was like, okay, cool. So dude, he's very excited. He was all about it. Loved coach CJ, loved seeing him interact with everybody. Uh, and it just got me excited. You know, he talked about some, some players. So he gave his speech, talked about, you know, being excited, the pieces that they brought in. So somebody that got mentioned by both Moose and CJ, I'll talk a little bit about Moose talking about him in a second, but he talked about Mark Thompson. He talked about how if you didn't watch the Gamblers last season, you should go watch the tape. You should go watch his Florida tape. 
Mark Thompson is going to be the center of this offense, which is a little scary. Uh, coming from a guy like me, who is a Minnesota Vikings fan, diehard, I watched since back when Adrian Peterson entered the league and our entire offense was based around Adrian Peterson for the Vikings. And when he tore his ACL, like the offense fell apart. It's, it's a scary thing to put that much on someone's shoulders. You know, they're just a man like all the other players. They're just a man. But yeah, he said that he's putting it all on Mark Thompson. Uh, he brought up Avery Genesee. He said he's one of, if not the best offensive tackle in the league. He's there. The run game runs through the offensive line and starts with Mark Thompson. He brought up, how can you not be excited? We brought in a first rounder. We have Ruben Foster. He brought up Ruben. I put him there. Uh, he's a smiling guy. Ruben's a very fun guy. He's a cool guy to have in the locker room. You know, you hear a lot of things about him being a hothead and everything. That's true, man, out on the field where you're supposed to be a hothead. But when it came to being in the locker room, when we were in Canton and we saw him interacting with the teammates, he really is just one of the team. It, you, he doesn't seem like a guy who's a first round draft pick, feels like he's better than other people. He was in there doing the uh, what heads up game where you like you point and you have to look the look the other way. He was doing all that with everybody, a part of the tournament. He's a good dude for the locker room. So very excited about Ruben. Then he talked Coach CJ talked about the D line draftees uh, as a whole. I wrote it down. I was taking notes there. Uh, if anybody saw the man who runs the ticketing for Houston, Brett, he took a photo of the event and I zoomed in. You could see me there literally taking notes. But CJ said, the team starts on defense. I went out and got the eight best defensive linemen in the draft. With Mark, of course, we are going to run the ball first and foremost, but secondly, we're going to hit the QB. So the two main points that the Roughnecks are heading into this season with is they're going to attack the quarterback. They're going to be incredibly aggressive on defense especially with blitz packages. We saw that last season with Chris Wilson. He's not afraid to blitz. We blitzed, I think, like the second most in the league, if not the first most. Uh, we blitz a lot, and that's because we had a lot of young, unproven talent. This year, we have a lot of proven talent. Like, we really do. Uh, the scheme worked, and now we're going to do it with like even bigger names, even better people. So very, very exciting. Uh, that was cool. And, you know, kind of inside of the mind of why did they go draft all these defensive linemen? Because that's going to be the main focal point of the team this year. So that was exciting. Uh, moving on to Daryl Johnson. Daryl talked a lot and it was really cool because he can't get in trouble, right? He's Daryl Johnson. He's the VP of football operations. So he really talks and it, he's not afraid to say things that other people in the league might keep closer to the vest. Like they are a little more afraid to be like, I don't know if I can talk about that. So it was really cool to see. So he talks about Mark Thompson. He's talked about Mark Thompson since before season one, dude. He was like his season one uh, MVP vote before the season started. He was like, I think he's going to be the guy. Now, Mark was hurt a decent amount of the season. Season one, season two, he barely missed MVP because, well, Magoo was just crazy, man. He's the Magoat. But he won Offensive Player of the Year. Fantastic. He talked about, he used Mark as an example for the league. And I tweeted about this. If you follow me on Twitter at AceUFM, you saw what I tweeted about it. Mark was a great talent coming out of the SEC, coming out of Florida. And he kind of put football off. He didn't go out. He didn't do workouts. He didn't play football for a while because of COVID and the pandemic. Because his mother is, Moose said, a two-time cancer survivor. When I posted about it, Mark quote tweeted it and let us know. She is a three-time cancer survivor. Just an incredibly strong woman who is out here proving the odds wrong. And it's fantastic. And Mark did not want to risk bringing COVID into the house to his mother who, you know, she is an at-risk person when it comes to COVID, especially in the early days when we didn't know a lot, you know? So he put his football dreams on hold and the USFL really was his way to get back into football and prove to everybody that he's still that guy and now the UFL. So really just an inspirational story, you know, really shows a little bit behind the veil. Mark goes online, he talks a lot of trash, he puts on a hard cover, but he really is just a good dude deep down. So that was something that I really appreciate Moose talking about. Then the next thing he talked about, I put Nolan Henderson in the QBs. The QBs, he talked about three QBs that are in Houston. He talked about Reed, Nolan, and Jarrett. And he said that it's going to be an absolute battle, that these are three guys that are all you know, relatively unheard of. They're not huge names in the spring football community yet, but it's going to be a good battle and any one of them could win. Then he specifically talked about Nolan Henderson, where a lot of people would expect that at the Houston kickoff event, you would talk about Reed Sinnott, who is supposed to be the QB1. You know, he was signed. We got rid of Kenji when we brought him on. All signs point to him starting. But Nolan Henderson really is the dark horse in this QB race. 
He's not the biggest quarterback, you know, but he comes from the small school. Delaware is very small and he's not very proven. He spent some time in the rookie camp for the Ravens. What Moose talked about and something that I've learned talking to people within the league is that Nolan Henderson has been on the USFL's radar since he came out of college because he is the kind of player that we're looking to bring, you know, that he comes from a small school. Maybe he didn't get as many looks because of that, because people questioned the amount of talent he was going against. And so they were talking about him last year in the USFL. Now, he didn't get his shot, but they brought him up again. This is something that happens. Uh, Daryl Johnston and um, what's his name? Jim Pop. They are out there and they have players that they like. So coaches will say the league likes this guy. So when the league likes this guy, when it comes to recruiting, when it comes to drafts, when it comes to dispersal draft, things like that, they kind of tell the team, you know, hey, if this guy isn't on your draft board right now, you should go look at him. And that doesn't mean that the team is going to be like, oh, well, we have to take him because the league says so. That's not it. But it does get them on people's radar. And someone like Nolan Henderson is a guy that they really like. They think that he could be a story that will sell tickets, right? He's a story that really proves the USFL and UFL and XFL can do what they say they're going to do and be the league of opportunity. So that's cool that Jim Pop, Daryl Johnston, they really pushed for Nolan Henderson and Lionel Vitell, Eric Price, you know, they all went and they said, yeah, you know what? We think he could do this. He has the mobility. He has the accuracy. Like he could be a spring football legend. He could be a UFL story. So that was cool and kind of just, you know, throws a little, a little monkey wrench into the narrative that we all are thinking about going into the Houston camp that Reed Sennett is hands down QB1. Well, Reed Sennett went into the Brahmas camp last year and he lost out to Jack Cohn. When they went out on the field and actually played, Reed Sennett outplayed Jack Cohn hands down, but maybe in camp, it's just a different story. Who knows? Reed Sennett produces on the field, but maybe at practice, it's just a little bit different and Nolan might get you know, his shot. And that's an exciting storyline. So I thought that that was really cool. Now, the other things, what else did I talk about? Quotes. So this was a quote that really stuck out and it's something that people talk about in the spring football community all the time. Becoming a developmental league. They talk about, especially my co-host on Polar Opposites, Webb, he talks about the G League for the NBA. Daryl specifically brought that up when somebody brought up this being a developmental league. He said, you know, we hear all about that, about minor league baseball, about the G League of the NBA, all that stuff. He said, the NFL has benefited from the NCAA being their pipeline for free for decades. Keyword, highlight, free, right? And we aren't going to compete with that. Realism, that's true. We are striving to be a standalone league that develops players who struggle with situations or timing to get them to the NFL. So I think that really shows a lot about the um, outlook, you know, the scope of what the UFL is trying to be. They're not trying to compete with NCAA. They're not trying to be where, you know, the NFL is getting their players. The NFL has already shown that they are down to tryout rules. They tried out the XFL kickoff. They, they wanted to learn this. Like, see if, if things could work. Uh, I think they're specifically going to be watching this pass interference uh, rule that they're using this year because they're using the 15-yard penalty and it's only a spot foul past 15 yards if it looks intentional. So that's very cool. And that's something that the NFL could adopt. But the NFL is not going to look at the UFL as a developmental, as a G League, as a minor league. It's going to be its own thing. It's something to feed your football craving in the offseason. So I thought it was really cool that he addressed that. Uh, let me check my other stuff. A fan that was there brought up that last year, there was a lot of outreach events. There were a lot of events in the city of Houston that the players and coaches were a part of. And Moose kind of talked about that. And because this is not the XFL team that was there last year, you know, the PR team is the same. The people who are handling the day-to-day -day operations in Houston, they're the same. But the team, the coaches, all of that is different from last year. So he talked about how that's still a learning curve. They asked about, are we going to be doing more community events and outreach with the team? He said, last year with the XFL, they had coaches and players travel up early for meet and greets, but we are still in the early stages to get things like that set up. When we do things, pro provide us feedback. That's the most important part. So right now, they're saying that it's not necessarily going to be meet and greets before the games and stuff. Hopefully there will be, but there's, it's not set in stone yet. So 
that was something interesting I thought fans would like to know. Don't plan on getting there early, all that stuff, you know? So that was something interesting. Uh, he also said, the one thing we don't want to be considered is someone who comes into your town for 24 hours and leaves, just using the city. We want to give back and help build the community. So they're definitely putting an importance, a priority on that. But right now, they're still in the early stages. That's just something that I thought that the fans would want to know. Uh, but moving on after that, the stadium. I saw a lot of people were not excited about Rice Stadium. They wanted TDECU, the home of the Roughnecks the past two seasons that they've existed. All I have to say is that being at Rice Stadium, parking looks easy. The stadium is genuinely beautiful. The sun was setting. I took this photo with my phone. The, on the big screen over there, they had the uh, Roughnecks hype video that they posted on YouTube. It was it was cool, man. They have seats with seat backs on a decent amount of them, but a lot of it, yeah, it's bench style. It's old school, man. It feels like back, you know, when you used to be watching football before it got kind of bougie, kind of posh. You know, so that was exciting. But it's very exciting. It's cool, old but beautiful. If you didn't know, this is where JFK gave his uh say not what you can do for Americans. I don't know. He gave some big speech at this stadium. So that's a cool thing as well. They have flight decks. That's the parts up underneath the second tier of seats. So they already told me that they are going to cover the second tier, the second deck. Unless they get enough ticket sales, they're covering those with tarps. Totally fine. Last year in Memphis, uh, they covered literally half the stadium in tarps. They only sold the home side. So that's fine. I like the fact that they're going to have both sides open. It looks better on TV. And it affects the teams. You know, you want to have fans behind both sides. You don't want to just have fans behind one side. It felt a little weird in Memphis last year. The away team was over there and it was just quiet. So I like that they're doing this. The flight decks are right under the second deck. Think of when you're about to go down to your seats, there's the little kind of fenced off areas that have tables and, you know, chairs that are attached. Those are the flight deck areas. Those were already sold out. They're already opening up more and trying to create more flight deck areas. I love that this is happening, that the tickets are selling. The woman who was in charge of marketing actually said that the flight deck sold out in 10 minutes. They opened up the sales for them. They sold out in 10 minutes. Very exciting. Cannot wait to hashtag fill the rig. So excited. So don't feel bad about the stadium. I would say at least go to one game and test out the stadium, see how it is before you just write it off and say, no, I want TDEC. There you go. So that's what happened uh, at the kickoff event. It was a great event. Loved getting to see CJ in the element with fans. He seemed incredibly excited to play in front of fans, to have fans there at the games. We got to fill the rig, guys. We got to be there for the team. This is so exciting, and it's going to be a great season. I think we have all the talent in the world. We have Mark Thompson. We have Avery Genesee. We have Ruben Foster. These guys that they literally were mentioning just in their welcome speeches. It's going to be a great season, guys. We have to fill the rig. We have to show the team support. I cannot wait. Remember the four hashtags they told us when I was there. I tweeted about it. It's hashtag UFL Roughnecks, hashtag Roughnecks Nation, hashtag Drill Baby Drill, and hashtag UFL 2024. If you want the Roughnecks account to retweet you, if you want to get you know more views on your stuff, use those hashtags. I'm searching for them. I'm looking for stuff. Very excited, guys. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe, like it. Tell other Roughnecks fans, man. I want us all on the same page. I want us all knowing that we got to be at that stadium. Come week one, we're going to beat Memphis, and then we're going to go on to DC week two, and we're going to beat the defenders, man. We are going 10-0 this season. I'm so excited. But until next time, rough them up. Drill, baby, drill. I'm so excited. Let's do it. I'm in the big leagues. Tony don't miss me. Balling like Houston. Hey, feeling like Whitney. I need a bag, bro.